Welcome everyone to our April 2024 session of AZ Bio Peers. AZ Bio is a time, um, AZ Bio Peers is a time when we come together to share insights into things that will help you grow your bioscience and life science business. And it's also an opportunity for you to hear from leaders in our community that are helping to drive the amazing growth that we're having here in Arizona. And today, the topic is going to be incubators and accelerators. Here in Arizona, we have a large, vibrant startup community, and our incubators and our, our accelerators help them move forward faster. So with that, I'm going to ask our panel to join us to um, introduce themselves and um, get us started. Anita, do you want to be first? Oh, A for Anita, goes first. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so excited to be here early in the morning. Um, so as you can see, Anita Bell, uh, and I'm covering it almost up, but I'm with the University of Arizona Center for Innovation. It's a business incubator located uh, in southern Arizona, uh, working virtually, which I think we'll talk about later. And um, I've been doing this for 20 years now. So uh, title is director and I mainly uh, work on the programming. Super excited to be here because I can talk about this topic days and days. <laughs> and I was actually at the incubator when you had your grand opening years ago. So yes, yes, that was a, a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> yes. Tom? Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Schumann. I'm the executive director at the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation. And like Anita, we run a business incubator for the bioscience industry. We're here on the campus of Gateway Community College. Um, been in this position eight years now. It's gone extremely fast, um, but got my start with incubators back in Michigan in the 1990s and was president of the Michigan Business Incubation Association. So been around this industry for many, many decades. Awesome. And Russ. Hi, good morning, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, Yelton and Associates, a background in business incubation. My first program was in Asheville, North Carolina. Took an abandoned 141,000 square foot BSF manufacturing plant, converted into a commercial food kitchen, 30,000 square feet of life science space, other things. Was fortunate to come to Arizona in 2009, took over a program called NASET in Flagstaff, and to date I've been involved in the creation of seven programs uh, across the state in various industries. I uh, served two terms on the International Business Incubation Association Board of Directors, and I've had the pleasure of working with all three of these folks for a few years, and I uh, look forward to the discussion. Awesome. So all incubators are not created equal, right? Each one has its unique characteristics. So um, Tom, why don't you tell me a little bit about the incubators that you're involved in today and what makes them different? Uh, thank you, Joan. Yeah, so um, uh, CEI, we've been, as I mentioned, been around for 12 years and we um, um, have a really nice state-of-the-art facility. We have um, 10 private uh, shared lab environments, wet lab environments for our companies to work in. And that's, you know, one of the big distinctions that, you know, bioscience incubators have. Um, it's very expensive real estate to develop uh, bioscience incubators. So there's just not enough space around. So one of our distinctive features is we do offer those, those private labs. Um, and, and what I talk about when I try and summarize what we do as incubators, I talk about the three C's. Um, it's coaching. So we are engaged uh, with our clients on a weekly basis, uh, coaching them. Uh, community uh, that's connecting them to other people, particularly here uh, inside the incubator. Uh, we'll have, you know, 20, 30 people in our program, all very smart, all at different stages along the development path. So there's always someone you can help ahead of you or someone behind you. So we try and create that collaborative uh, culture here, um, which is very supportive when you uh, feel like you're a lonely entrepreneur working on your own to have a community around you. And the third C is connections, and that's connecting them out into the broader community, whether it's venture capital, attorneys, website developers, FDA consultants, but providing those connections of, of valued resources that, that are willing to work with um, our types of clients. Awesome. And Anita, you know, as I remember the first time I was at where your incubator was um, or is, and at that time, it was a major facility for IBM. 
And mm-hmm. today we are growing the next generation of IBMs. And how do you do that? Um, yeah, so uh, Tom has three C's, we have three P's. So you can see right. program people places, <laughs> but same thing, right? Uh, it's all about uh, our program is really the top uh, top line of that. So we do have facilities. Um, we actually, during the pandemic, opened up a second facility in, in Tucson, up in Oro Valley. And uh, we are not just focused on bioscience, but we also have uh, mixed technologies is what we call it. Um, but really, it's all about the programming. So it's uh, we have mentors in residence. We have subject matter experts. And um, the pandemic was actually an accelerator for us to have a virtual program. So all of our services are delivered virtually right now. So we can really reach the companies, the founders, where they're at. And that allows us to be very um, uh, efficient. So they don't uh, have to drive all the way out (laughs) to our facility. Um, Even though the companies that need the facilities, they're out there and can do that. But it's uh, pretty much like Tom said too, you know, it's the connections, it's the network. So we also have what we call a program roadmap. So it helps the companies assess where they are in their uh, knowledge and development of the different topics that are needed to develop a startup company. And that really gives us a very customized uh, look at where they are and how we can help them to get to the next level. Awesome. And, you know, Russ, you've worked with incubators across the state. Um, A little bit about, you know, what are what's the formula that, you know, really adds to the growth of these companies? Oh, great question. Um, well, yeah, I, I think the main thing, and Anita and Tom have touched on it, is connections. I think a good program, in my opinion, you know, we don't give people a key and say, come see us when you need us, you mm-hmm. know, which means we don't accept everybody. I've sat on the selection committee for CEI. So we're looking for a certain company at a certain place in time with certain things that they have ready to grow and scale. And if they're not, that doesn't mean we don't still work with them. You know, we provide resources, mentorship, but when they come in, they're in an actual program. Uh, I always love to say the day you come in, we're talking about the day you're going to leave because we are not a forever place. That is not what we're going to do. We're going to grow you and scale you. And the beauty of incubators is that they can really develop the types of companies a community wants, whether it's life science, arts, mixed use, other things. And then, you know, like in Flagstaff, for example, with NASAT, we had the initial small 10,000 square foot facility. We filled that really fast and we discovered there was nowhere for companies to go. We had nowhere for these companies to go afterwards. So we built a 28,000 square foot accelerator. Now we've had multiple companies um, graduate out of that into the community, which is exactly our mission and what we're trying to do. Right. And and Tom, you have the um, facility in Wexford. Um, That is a step up facility too, right? Yes. Uh, Yeah, we do. We do two things down there, but yeah, we have a good partnership with Wexford Science and Technology and they've opened up on the fifth floor of that building what's called Connect Labs. And it's about 20 startup spaces that range from 500 to a couple thousand square feet. So some, some room for growth. It's supported by a wonderful shared lab that uh, Fisher Thermo uh, Scientific um, has stocked with the uh, latest uh, technology and such. And then um, on the ground floor of that building, we operate um, LabForce. And LabForce is a training program for the bioscience industry. You know, we were noticing that as our companies had graduated and started growing, that they were having a hard time developing the talent that they needed. So so LabForce was conceived. um, And just like Anita mentioned, when the pandemic came, a lot of it went virtual. So so we have a a learning platform now with about 400 bioscience courses and 200 business courses that are loaded into it. So we can get that training development out to to our clients, Uh, mostly in the areas of quality, compliance, regulation, um, because those are the common topics that cut across any uh, life science company, and uh, we can find a market there. So, you know, as we look at the companies, everybody doesn't need the same thing. So, how do you assess? And we'll start with Anita, and then kind of, you know, share this discussion. But how do you assess what a company needs, and and also? You know, when is it time 
for them to, you know, fly out of the nest. <laughs> yeah, I, I sometimes, you know, I, I, I say to people when they ask about our um, business operations, our and excuse my language, but our business model sucks because our goal is to kick them out when they're successful. So, you know, it's really it's it's kind of an interesting business model for incubators. But that's really what we do. You know, we take them in when they need a lot of help. And then when they are on their own and uh, are ready to fly, then, you know, off they go. We let them go. But uh, interesting question. So um, we, of course, have been doing this for 20 years. So uh, UACI has been in operation for over 20 years now because we celebrated 20 years last year. And um in a couple of years ago, it, again, it was, I know we printed it right in March of 2020. We got our first print of our roadmap. Uh, so we developed um, many of the uh, audiences probably familiar with the business model canvas. And it's, you know, on one piece of paper, you kind of fill out all your, your business idea and it's just a nice overview. So we kind of took that concept and we have what we call a business uh, a roadmap. So it's the program roadmap. And so we have 28 topics on there. And it's everything from problem identification to uh, entity formation to IP protection to marketing collateral to sales. And then um, the companies themselves assess, do they know what this topic even is? Are they working on it? Are they at a stage where they can really think, yeah, we got it. And um, then we have our mentors in residence and they do the same thing. So and then we have it starts those conversations where you think, you know what, um, you know, you're doing in this topic. We don't really see that or you don't think, you know, but you have this. So it's very customized and individualized. And then in the back end, because we can't gather all the data, it gives us the because we have over 50 companies in the program these days. It gives us from a pro programmatic um, standpoint, the overview, nobody knows what marketing is. We work a lot with scientists and technologists, so I have to pick that topic, <laughs> right? And then we'll bring in the resources for everybody to learn more about it. But it also gives this opportunity uh, for the companies individually to work with their mentor and residents who acts as a coach. So we have to see or a subject matter expert, because we do have uh, five subject matter experts on different topics that every startup needs to really deal with. So it's again, it's just, uh, you, know, you know, you said each incubator is different. You've seen one, you've seen one. So our approach, uh, we get a lot of early ones is really assess, you know, where are they? Because we learned um, a lot of those uh, founders, super smart in many things, of course, very no knowledgeable. And then there's a few potholes. So we want to catch those potholes early so we can uh, level them up. So, Tom, um, you've been doing this for a long time, too. What are some of the things that you see that show, you know, somebody's starting to get ready to fly? Yeah. Um, so just like uh, Anita, we, we, we've developed a roadmap. Um, and, and the roadmap is uh, customized to, to every client. We don't do cohort programs, so it's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, the, and the process for that really begins during the intake process. And we have a very thorough gap analysis program that we run clients through while they're still applying. And, and we try and find out where all those gaps are. And, and we know what gaps we're good at filling. And so when their gaps meet what our capabilities are, then it's a good fit. We move them forward into, into the program and then they'll come in front of our selection committee where people like Russ will uh, listen to their pitch and then grill them for the next half hour on, you know, their, their plans, their strategies and such. And, and coming out of that selection committee, we get additional information, uh, Patty and I, um, about um, what that roadmap should look like for those companies where the particular uh, gaps that need to be filled or bumps along the road that Anita calls them, the, the speed bumps. Um, and then, um, then, and then we have, you know, um, our, our secret weapon here, which is, um, Patty Dubois, and she is a very seasoned business counselor, um, but has one of the best Rolodexes, uh, in the state of Arizona. If you need something, she will help find it. So, um, I like to call her our, our director of success. Um, and she moved people along that roadmap. 
Um, and um, I, I wish that um, we were able to move people through here quicker than we do. We offer a two week, or excuse me, a two year lease. At the end of two years, they can pitch for another two years. So we have a lot of companies that are in here four years and um, quite often they're ready to fly. Um, and what's holding them back is, uh, as we've mentioned before, the lack of locations for them to spin out to and, and to, to continue their growth. So um, uh, we wish we moved people through quicker, uh, to be quite honest. You know, throughput is what makes incubators successful. Uh, it's not letting people sit in place for, for a, a period of time. Um, and and it, it's just like your... Um, your college age kids, there comes a point where you say, we're not renewing, you know, so let's start, you know, your next plan for, uh, for where you're going to land and um, you will get booted out of the nest. And so Russ, you know, we've been talking about the, you know, physical incubators, um, but you have been very involved with the Flynn Foundation and their bioscience entrepreneurship program which is a virtual accelerator type of program. Can you explain how that's different? Sure. Yeah, so the Flynn Biosense Entrepreneurship Program, uh, we created 11 years ago. Uh, we put almost 100 companies through that with the idea being, um, we're going to give them a little bit of money. It's 30000 It's not enough to move the needle per se in and of itself, but it does a number of other things. Uh, number one, it gives them a seat on the Roadmap Steering Committee. So they actually get to, you know, meet Joan and other people that, you know, they may not have had the opportunity to do. Um, they also get a coach uh, for a year uh, that works directly with them. And this can be in conjunction with Tom, with Anita, with other programs, or it may be that they are on their own, right? They've just found a little place, uh, but they're looking for those connections. And then that coach will do the same thing. We will customize a plan for them and reach into our Rolodexes, figure out where they are, what's happening, and really what that commercialization path uh, means for them. Um, and through all the connections and everything, you know, we'll take the list of uh, committee members, 100, and I'll always say, okay, tell me next month, who are you asking to meet? Because you have the Flynn name behind you, and if you want to call a certain individual, you know, I've got Flynn behind me, they're going to talk to you. And so those companies get the ability to really scale those connections much faster than they would otherwise. Right. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the the elephant in the room, right, which is funding, right? As you said, Russ, $30,000 is not going to move the needle for most of these companies. And so one of the things that AZ Bio has been working on now since 2014 is how do we address that? And so that started with the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference, where companies are being evaluated by real venture capitalists, right? People that have significant money um, that are saying whether they're ready to present at White Hat or not yet. And um, that then progressed. And by the way, that formula is working. Companies that have gone through that program have now raised over $1.8 billion. Um, you know, so they are, you know, matri you know, growing up and we're seeing them be becoming very successful. But in addition to that, we also looked at, you know, how do we address the fact that there's not large institutional capital here in Arizona? We have a growing number of, um, you know, emerging life science funds or general funds here in Arizona, but none of them are at life science scale, right? They are not multi-billion dollar funds. And so AZ Advances was created to, to help with that, to create that type of an institutional over time. Um, Russ, as, as a trustee for AZ Advances, um, you know, what are some of the reasons that you have gotten involved and what are some of the challenges to fundraising that an incubator or an accelerator can help these companies with? 
sure. Yeah, one of the reasons um, you know we're working on we're working on AZ advances is really an evergreen fund. Um, you know, we have different funds that have come up over the years. You know, they get depleted. Then we go through these periods where we haven't had them. Right now, we have quite a number, uh, and that's great. But the goal of this is to get the endowment up and then use the interest to continuously put money not only in the companies but also in the programs and the incubators, being sure that they have all of those pieces with that. If you're running an incubator, um, you know, unless you're a private accelerator with a fund, you don't have your own fund. So you're taking your clients and you're continuously going over their slide decks and their presentations and their pitches. And then you're doing the same thing. You're running it. And, you know, sometimes we say, you know, it's it's impossible almost to really get a company off the ground when you only spend 50 percent of your time running it because the other 50 percent you're chasing money because you've got to make payroll. Right. And we've all been there, all done that. So AZ advances, the goal of that, again, is a consistent stream of funds over time to supplement the other things that are out there while also putting money directly into the ecosystem and supporting to make Anita and John Tom's uh, jobs hopefully a little bit easier. Well, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, the companies that we're helping are developing the treatments and cures mm -hmm. that we're going to need someday or somebody we care about is going to need someday. So this is this is a, a really important mission. So um, we've talked about what they are, but what are some of the misconceptions that people have? What, you know, when they, they come in, they have certain expectations. How do you manage those expectations of what you can do and what you don't do? Anita? Mm, great question. <laughs> Um, and I think uh, Tom alluded to this a little bit. So we also uh, have an admissions process and uh, it's not um, as stringent as a CI because we still accept uh, very early companies as well. But what we are looking for is um, coachability in uh, the founders. So if somebody comes in and they know everything, there's just not anything we can contribute and help with. So, you know, it is a bit, um, might seem like a nuisance, our admissions process, because there's a form you have to fill out and then you have to meet with people and all that. But it's really uh, to assess, you know, how how coachable might the founding team be? And also, um, the we can't really assess the viability of a technology, but just the baseline, right? Is this something that seems scalable? So that's the level we are at. Um, so those are really the two things. But then um, we, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in the morning. What was the question? Poof. It just <laughs> skipped out of my head. <laughs> well, but but those misconceptions, right? Oh, you misconceptions. Know, the yes, expectations. Misconceptions. Yes. So, we get people that come in and they think we have money, you know, we don't have money. So it is, you know, so that's very easy. You know, we clear that up. And then also sometimes we think we're going to run the company. So that's also, you know, not something we do. We coach, we mentor, we prop, we cheerlead. But, you know, if, uh, if, it, if, and when it comes to actually doing the work, that's, that's on the founder. And we just keep reiterating this message. Right. And, um, also, uh, most of our companies are first-time founders, so there's a lot of ed education going in because they don't know what VC money is versus angel money versus, you know, debt versus non-dilutive. It's a lot of education. Um, and I think even as at the state level, as the community, we see we just have to continue to educate, especially those first-time founders. And it's a continued uh, effort that we're doing and um, I think that's also where we have uh, with our mentors, you, uh, it goes really very quickly, very almost personal to get to this where they have aha moments. And also it's a very safe environment. So I usually say, you know, I, I love the stupid questions because I don't believe in stupid questions, but there's no stupid questions for me. So I felt like our companies appreciate that because again, they're first time founders. And it's a safe environment. They can ask me anything and there's no judgment. Tom. Yeah. So, misconceptions. Two of the ones that you know Anita mentioned. One is that A, we 
have money available for them and we will do their work. You know, both of those are, are, are myths uh, quite a bit. Um, two, two things um, in addition to that. Um, I think one of the misconceptions that many of our founders have is uh, very similar to the, you know, I'll build it and they will come. That, you know, that their success is guaranteed that they have the best, you know, fill in the blank ever. And once people understand their technology, the money's just going to come flowing into them. Um, so what we find is that many of our founders haven't done enough um, research on their market. So we do a lot of market validation work with them early on to, to, val to, to, to make sure that there's someone at the end of the road here that's going to buy their product at some time, some way for them to be able to start to demonstrate some traction that will attract the capital that they need. Um, I think the other um, misconception quite often is that um, these um, people who are coming out of academia primarily are going to be the CEO who's running this large corporation uh, someday. And two things, one, the, the, the skill set sometimes isn't there. It's a very different skill set uh, to be a CEO than it does to be a, a top researcher. And, and they don't translate uh, over too well. So that's a, a misconception. And so Part of that is talking with people about what, what is the reasonable exit strategy for the technology that they have. Are they going to launch you know, a, a unicorn or should they really be licensing this off to a strategic partner that can take it into the market for them? So it's, it's, it's those kinds of misconceptions of how I take this neat thing that I have and find a way to capitalize it and, and benefit from it. Absolutely. And, you know, in my role at AZ Bio, um, it, I, I jokingly say, you know, I've got 345,000 kids. <laughs> and, um, and that's how many people work inside of the companies that are members of AZ Bio, just in our state. So sometimes as a parent, you have to have tough conversations. And, you know, you need to look at a market analysis and say, yeah, this is a really novel, cool idea, but there's 30 other people that have already had it and are much further along than you are. Or, um, yes, I understand that you want to go out and raise money and that you're very frustrated because 10 people told you no. Um, but the reality is, is that you're going to have 100 conversations before somebody tells you yes. And so how do you deal with those tough conversations, Russ? Oh, yeah. Fun conversations. Uh, I think one of my favorite questions is when do you have to be replaced as the CEO? And you see the color kind of drain from the face and it's like, hey, it's a legitimate question, you know, and I think that's part of a good program. It's a great question, Joan, of the involvement, because as Anita said, it's a safe place. But we've seen this movie 100 times and 99 times it went over the cliff. Right. It was a disaster. And just because you're in love with what you did in the lab doesn't mean anybody's going to pay you for it. You know, and, you know, we, you know, tell me about your competition. Our favorite response is I have no competition. There's nothing out there, right? It's like, oh, wow, you know, but we get really involved. I mean, to the point I have literally um, negotiated a spouse out of a company through a divorce, one of our clients. <laughs> we see everything that goes on and sometimes you have to sit them down. I had a client that was coming to my office and always had his financials up on my screen because we require open book accounting. And it's like, you're on the verge of bankruptcy how far are you going to push this? So we have those realistic conversations and hopefully we're going to help them miss not just the potholes, but the falling off the cliff. Yep. And then I would just say at about 18, 24 months, they become teenagers. They know it all. They've gotten it all. And then sometimes they become that uh, kid that's in your basement that never wants to leave. They're just very comfortable. So we have to have that as time to fly conversation as well. Yeah. Tom? Yeah. We need to practice tough love. That, that's how we phrase it here, you know, and um, it, it takes, you know, different forms um, at different times. Um, you know, we've had to ask um, companies to leave um, our incubator early um, because um, they, they were starting to make claims in public about things that their product could do that their product couldn't do. And so, you know, trying to, you know, maintain integrity in our program, we have to have a discussion that says, you know, you can no longer represent us and, and you're going to have to move out of here. Um, so those are tough, tough questions. 
Um, there's also tough questions about when is it time just to, to throw in the towel that, that you have really reached the, the end of the road. Um, there's no venture capital uh, coming to your rescue. You, you've exhausted all the federal grants that you can. And, um, you know, it's, it's time to turn out the lights. Yeah. It, hap it, it, it happens. It's part of the startup world. It is. And, you know, startup is an interesting, I, I get this question a lot. What's a startup? And, you know, at AZ Bio, we have a core startup program, which is that um, from the time that your company is formed, right, whether it's an LLC or a corporation, for two years, you have access to all of the AZ Bio programs with a free membership. But when you turn to you're not a startup anymore, right? You're either continuing to work, right, on, on your company structure or, right, you're emerging and you're growing. And so, you know, Tom, you mentioned, you know, you have two-year leases, right? And I know, Anita, you, you have some timelines in your roadmap. Um, when I go out into the world and I'm talking to ACA or GPEC or Startup Nation or wherever I'm talking to, right, everybody uses startup as this ubiquitous term, almost to the point of you're a startup until you're public. Okay. Where do you draw the line? Good question. Um, oh, you unmute again, Joan. You, Tom. I'll take a I'll take a stab at that, Joan. Um, when a company starts earning revenue from sales, it's no longer grants or it's no longer investments. They're, they're trying to sell. That's when they're maturing, and that's you know um, that's when they become an adult uh, in this world. When they can self-sustain themselves on a revenue stream, that's that's the time for them to yeah to move on. Yeah, yeah same. Uh, if I may jump in. Um... Uh, again, ours are usually so early that, um, and we do have, we have, again, we're super flexible. We're in Tucson, you know, we're not too picky about some things, <laughs> but it's all about uh, moving the companies forward. But because we also have mixed uh, technologies, not just, but bioscience companies, and I call life science, bioscience, healthcare, all in bio, uh, is about 40% of our companies. And that stayed consistent when we had, um, you know, a dozen companies and now over the 50 so that's interesting, but um, we have two year agreements and then they're extendable by a year. And that's, uh, we have some companies that have been in our program for five years. And this one where we may need to have this conversation soon about, hey, <laughs> but it's also they, uh, they get, um, so they're not in residence, but rather it's the virtual program and they get benefit out of it. So that's really our mission is uh, to be beneficial. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's again, you know, just being super flexible, but also uh, supporting them. Uh, startup for me is figuring out a repeatable, sustainable business model. So that is um, somewhat dependent on revenue. But, you know, if you figure out, because uh, as we know, some life science companies will never get to revenue, right? They may exit sooner. So once they figure out their pathway to that, um, you know, then in my mind, they're no, no longer a true startup. Yeah, and I think and, it's important. Go ahead, Russ. I'm going to jump in real quick. That They can't be in startup mode forever, right? To your point, Joan, when you've, when you've been 10 years of SBIRs, which is great, we want that, but there's no commercialization process or progress, right? You're not moving through the, that. You know, we're going to have to have that hard conversation of, is this a research project? Because if it is, it's not what we're meant to do. It's not what we're here to do on the long-term basis. Short-term, yes, to get you up and running, but not forever. And, and that is a tough conversation, right? Um, from an investor's perspective, and as you guys know, you know, my first life science investment was in 2007, my first investment in an early stage company was in 1987. And when we look at, you know, where this goes, it becomes apparent very, very quickly what kind of companies are investable and what companies are not. And so 
you all work with our, our wonderful angel groups and with independent investors and now our emerging um, funds. How do you have the conversation with somebody that, sorry, guys, this company is just not investable? I'll jump on that one. Um, well, I, I think it's it's a number of different things. Uh, usually it's the team. You know, we may see a great technology, but there's not a team that's really going to move this forward. And the founder's not open to developing that team. Um, and, you know, it's that's the kind of come to Jesus conversations we have to have. And it's not that we know everything, right? But we know a lot of other people that we can bring in. If they're not looking to scale, and then the other thing is there's no clear exit. Well, if there's no clear exit, no investor is going to put a dime into your company um, because that's something that they all have to see. So part of that's that educational process of having them understand, you know, and, and the last thing I will say on that is investment is not for every company. You know, the founders have to understand what it means because you do two rounds, you're probably going to be a minority shareholder. How does that feel? So those are the conversations they have to have. Yep, same. Uh, you know, it's a lot of education again for sim founders, right? It's uh, technologists, scientists, right? It's a whole new world for them. So really between the mentoring, the subject matter experts, and we have a really great relation with our Desert Angels. And then um, it's really going through, you know, this is this is what's required. This is what's required. And having this continued um, presentation uh, conversation, they say, you know, we're going as what's frustrating to us is when they don't come to us, when we find out, oh, you you applied. Right. <laughs> But then it's also, you know, what, uh, so we dig deep, we try to do almost like a due diligence before the investor would do it. Because again, it's a safe space for us, right? It's, um, and um, really uh, coming uh, to that and continued, continued conversation. So, and I, I think I speak for all, all three of us, the most frustrating part for us is when they don't come to us to for help. <laughs> so you know, occasionally we have those companies and then they're like, oh, you know, I did this. And we're like, what? <laughs> you know, we didn't know. And then it it fails or, you know, it doesn't go well. It's like, well, you know, come to us first. Um, and I do want to do a little plug for the Flynn Foundation because we talked about that earlier. So a great resource of uh, funding for our companies, especially I know 30,000 isn't all that much, but a lot of times it's uh it's this catalytic uh money and also being attached to the flynn is like amazing so we also tell our companies it's not i mean money is nice of course right but it's really the connections so and i'm i'm i have to just say we had four of the six uh that were awarded this year were uh either are currently or were in our program so you know, just a little plug that maybe we know a little bit of what we're doing, but um, it's such a great program. You know, and um, I actually serve as the banker for that program, right? So, oh, no. so it. all of the you, um, <laughs> all of the funding comes in, and then they have to review their plans with me. You know, I'm monitoring their progress. And if they, you know, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, they, we have those conversations too. But the, um, you know, I think, you know, Anita brought up a really good point, which is, you know, the incubators are there to, to help the companies, but they're not clairvoyant. And so I, I can tell you, I spend more time cleaning up messes when somebody didn't ask for help. Then I do giving advice when somebody needs help. So Tom, you know, give me, you know, a hypothetical of what happens when you don't ask. Yeah, well, we have a, a, a case study from a number of years ago of a company that pushed forward with their product development um, and completely neglected the development of their quality management system and the documentation that they needed. So when the time came to um, move in front of the FDA for clearance on their product, they had no documentation at all. Um, and so it set them back 18 months and they had to go back to the drawing board and recreate all of their uh, design and research and um, all their data. So um, 
not asking that question early enough of what do I need to make sure that, you know, my quality system is in place um, can cost you a lot later on. So it's a simple question. You know, we, we run a program called Quality for Founders. Uh, it's a six week program that helps um, every one of our founders understand what regulatory path that they're going to be on and how, what kinds of resources, what kinds of systems and software they're gonna to need to support that quality journey um, as they move forward. So those are the little kinds of things that founders can get slipped up on if they're not paying attention to it. Yeah. So Russ, um, you've been in this incubation environment for a very long time, right? We all have. And um, one of the things that I'm starting to see, and it's, it's concerning, is I'm getting a ton of emails from people saying, I want to accelerate your business. I want to incubate your business. You know, come work with us. We're the best. Um, and, and the red flag for me is when they send me an email to AZ Bio saying that they want to invest in my business that they can help me find buyers. Yep. Um, now, if they had done a simple internet search, they would have known that I'm a nonprofit. You cannot buy me and you cannot invest in me, right? So, but what? there are red flags out there and you're, the people in your incubators are getting these same emails. What are some of those red flags of these incubator and accelerator programs, either virtual or in place all over the country that companies need to be looking for? No, great question. I think one of the first things is who are they? You know, just as, you know, you would do a background search on somebody you're going to employ, who who are these individuals? What have they done? What's their track record? Uh, what's the agreements? You know, I've seen agreements where, oh, come in, we're going to coach you and work with you. By the way, in the little print, we want 40% of your company. Wow. You know, and we see those companies come in and they've already made that mistake. Or uh, we had one that uh, came in while I was in NASAT. He came in and he was all excited. I just got a quarter of a million dollars and literally held up the check. It's like, well, what are the terms? And he's like, oh, wait a minute. And we look at it. It was 51% of the business. First investment, first money in. And so I think for companies, it's they need to understand what do they need? What are they looking for? You have your core competencies. You have your expertise, right? And then the second question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to grow into? And then who has those resources? And be sure that those resources are very clear. The engagement is clear. Our programs always require open book accounting. Everything's confidential, but we're going to look at your records, quarterly benchmark reviews, monthly reviews, so people are in an actual program. And that's not for everybody, nor should it be. So I think making sure when they sign on that line, they know what they're signing and they know what they're getting, but almost more importantly, they know what they're giving away. Yeah, we always ask um, uh, our clients to um, get permission to talk to previous participants in the program as part of the due diligence. And if they're not willing to offer up other people in the program, then they're, they're certainly a red flag. And to Russ's point, whenever they're asking for equity, um, that's a red flag if they're asking for it up front. And that's when you need to have your attorney go over whatever uh, you're going to be signing. Yeah, and I actually love the, because this topic is about lo your local incubators in Arizona. So, you know, seek out a local resource, a trusted resource uh, first. So, of course, we have the University of Arizona name uh, with us, which is uh, gives people confidence. Uh, I know CI is attached to Maricopa County. So look for your local resource first as a trusted resource. And then uh, I also want to highlight we're not exclusive. So it's not an exclusive relationship that we have. <laughs> so many of our companies are in other programs also. But that's, again, you know, your local resource, your trusted resource can help you vet them. And if it's a program that we've never heard about, we are all networked, you know, we are also part of the MBI, the International Business Innovation Association. So I, I've checked before, I'm like, oh, they're out of Maryland. So I, I contact my Maryland colleagues and I'm like, hey, have you heard of them? Do you know anything about them? So really doing your due diligence on that, because yes, a lot of times, um, you know, unfortunately, there's some equity stake in there. And, and especially when it's a, a 
blank, you know, 5% and you don't know what you're getting, uh, be a little wary about it, um, just as a precaution. So, you know, we talked a little bit about AZ advances and our long-term strategy for funding is in partnership with the state of Arizona and the Arizona Health Innovation Trust Fund. And, you know, we and our government partners are continuing to work on how we're going to create that sustainable funding. You guys don't have trust funds. You're not trust fund babies. Um, <laughs> how do you fund your programs? I mean, you, we talk about how we help people, but you have rent and you have to keep the lights on and you have personnel. Where does your money come from? Tom? Yeah, so we have... Um... Our model is 50-50. So the Maricopa Community College District supports us about 50% of our revenue, and the other 50% comes from uh, the leases and workshop fees and things that we charge our clients. So it's a 50-50 it's a mix for our agency. Anita? Yeah, for us, actually, that's a myth buster too. So we do not get any money from the University of Arizona, even though we got the, we got the A. There's no money attached to us. <laughs> so... Uh, but yes, yeah, so we are, uh, as you mentioned, we're located with, within the University of Arizona Tech Parks, which also doesn't get any money from the university, but they have real tenants that pay rents. So they have the larger and uh, so we're part of their operating budget. Uh, but so we are cost center, but we also want to cost less. So we have uh, grants that we go after. There's a great program. It's a growth accelerator fund competition that we've uh, received money through a few times. Um, a lot of times we use the direct for the benefit of the companies that come in. So we were able to fund our intern program through that. Um, we get a little bit more of money from the Wells Fargo Foundation, uh, also going to our intern program. We uh, have developed a sponsored launch program. So uh, firms, companies uh, sponsor a company in the program, which is fantastic for everybody involved. And then uh, we were able, again, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to get a contract with the Department of Energy. So I mentioned earlier about 40% of our companies in biolife sciences, about 25% are in energy and sustainability because we have a contract with the Department of Energy for their um, um, uh, American-made program. So it's uh, let's pull uh, energy generation and distribution. Well, distribution is local, but generation support back into the U.S. Uh, for manufacturing. So we um, have uh, some money coming in through that that we that we work again. So, um, Russ. You know, we're we're talking about institutions here that are supported by community colleges, are supported by universities, um, but major institutions also have that, right? We've seen that with Honor Health and their accelerator, with Mayo Clinic and the ASU partnership. Um, you know, how do and why would um, for-profit or, or large established nonprofit entities choose to create an incubator or an accelerator? Oh, great question. I, I think it's mission, you know, it's outcome, it's what's the impact. You know, you said earlier, you know, they're working on, you know, uh, technologies, you know, healthcare systems that we're going to need. Maybe we have loved ones who will be needed it and they're gone and they didn't get those opportunities, right? So I, I think for those larger organizations, if they look at their ecosystem, they also see sometimes these technologies that come through that they want to adopt, that they need in their own systems. And it's a way of kind of seeding and funding that, right? But I think overall, it's what they want uh, through their missions in their communities. And it is the sense of community and helping everybody in the long term. And I think that, you know, that is really important. And we're starting to come towards the end of our hour. And so um, what I'd like to do is, is use these last few minutes to talk about, um, you know, if, if you were talking to someone who's listening to us on the call or who's going to be listening to us on the internet later, what, what is that one thing that you want them to, to take away from today, 
right? What is that one thing that you can share that's really going to make a difference? Anita? Oh, first, wow. I'm not, I'm not the wisdom girl, but um, I, I think I go back to, you know, it, uh, I love that saying when I learned it, it takes a village to build a company. And there are so many resources available. Uh, so really encouraging um, founders, founding teams to seek those resources and to take advantage of them. Um, you know, place is last on the list. Um, sometimes we have companies, they're like, oh, you got those fabulous labs and all this stuff. And, you know, we rent a bench, but it's really about the business development around it um, to make it into a great company. And um, we that's what we love to do. With Sometimes people come in, I'm like, sorry to bother you. I'm like, you're not bothering me. I'm here for you. That's what I thrive on. Believe it or not. I love it. So take advantage of it. Just take advantage of the resources. Tom. Yep. I really have to agree with that. It really is get con connected with the community. You know, we have a saying that innovation dies in isolation. You mm -hmm. really need to bring, you know, the village together. You need to bring, you know, a team together to really be successful and that's one of the reasons why we, we run the, the Venture Cafe um, event every Thursday. It's to create tighter connections in the Phoenix Innovation Ecosystem. And the second Thursday um, of every month, um, Venture Cafe focuses on bioprinters. And we have a program with the Flynn Foundation. And so there'll be you know, 30 to 40 you know, bioprinters just like yourselves there each Thursday. Those are the kind of communities that you want to start tapping into. Russ? Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's that opportunity to take advantage of resources that you're not going to get if you just find a lab in an office and get a key. You know, it's uh, one of our staff observed one time, you know, we see them going down the hallway. They're all excited and high fiving because they spun a piece of human skin and the next day their head's down because they can't make pay. Yeah, that's the reality. You know, it's that moment in the month when we put them all in the same room and we go around what's working what's not working if you found a resource uh, i remember when i was running my first incubator i finished with a client and opened my door and i had five people lined up because they had something they needed to talk about right now and as anita said you know that's something that gets us excited we're there for you whether it's evenings weekends um we're there 24 7 pretty much so it's a great opportunity to take advantage of something and really scale and I, I guess for me, the, the biggest frustration I see is when we have the programs and we have the resources and they're not getting used. And, you know, examples of that, right? If you are a, a company that fits the AZ Bio definition of a startup, right? You were created in the last two years. If you're not taking advantage of that free membership, you're leaving resources on the table. When we look at the bio business solutions program that AZ Bio offers, um, that has resources for companies. And you can get to that. Just go to, you know, bio.org slash save. And you'll see over 16 programs that if your company is using them, you're going to save money. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to save money than it is to raise money. Mm. And, you know, in AZ Bio's world, last year, the companies that used that program saved over $4 million. That's more money than the Arizona Innovation Challenge gives out or Flynn gives out. And so, you know, taking advantage of the resources that are available are critically important. Talking to these committed leaders that are running our incubators and accelerators, they can point you towards these programs. If you're ready to be talking to investors, right, you should be applying for the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference right now because we're going to do early acceptance for about half the companies before we go to the Bio International Convention where I'm going to be meeting with VCs for an entire week talking about White Hat and what we're doing and AZ advances. So getting them engaged in that. And so the easiest thing that you can do as entrepreneurs is take advantage of the programs that have already been set up to help you. 
whether it is our incubators, our accelerators, programs for companies of every size, like Bio Business Solutions, the early stage startup programs that we have at AZ Bio, the free programming that Flynn Foundation offers, and all of the different things that go into it. And, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up our time, the, the last thing I want to do is say thank you, because number one, all of you have committed decades of service to our um, entrepreneurs, but also you have built a community of volunteers, attorneys, accountants, ex you know, experienced CEOs that are helping these companies. And I want to give you an opportunity as we're wrapping up to thank the people that help you. Russ, you want to start us off? Yeah. Well, Joan, thank you helping to uh, lead our state. And, you know, thanks to Anita and Tom. And, you know, we started the State Incubation Association years ago, just trying to work together and, you know, figure out how we share those resources. So kudos to everyone in the environment. Together, we make ourselves stronger and better. Anita? Yeah, that's a really, really long list. <laughs> so, but yeah, starting with the four here, uh, a year, the companies that are on on the on the Zoom, you know, looking at this. Um, uh, again, it goes back to it takes a village. We have a large village and um, so many generous people. Again, uh, people want to give back. Success successful people they come to us as the innovation center. They ask, "How can I give back?" We connect them. It, it's a long list. Oh, I, I can't even start. It's just like anybody I've ever talked to, I guess, is on the list uh, because it takes uh, a lot of people to make this work. So thank you, everybody. Tom? It, yeah, and absolutely. It's it's all about um, both the team um, that we've assembled here. We, we've, we've grown to 12 employees now um, at CEI uh, from three. So uh, a large team that gets all the work done um, but it's that broader reach out to uh, the, the volunteers, people giving their time, the mentors, the coaches. I mean, it, it is, um, you know, an encouraging thing that we are getting more and more knitted together um, in this ecosystem. You know, it, it's one of the foundational things, right, that, that needs to be in place for everything else to grow. So um, it, it's great, great to see, you know, that kind of growth starting to happen. And as you can see, right, there's the AZ Bio pin that we all wear. And that pin, Tom's hiding his pin. Um, so the reason for the pin is so that, you know, we can identify each other as leaders who are working together to double the size of our life science sector by 2033 and when we do that the economic impact is huge right today in 2021 the economic impact of arizona's life science sector was 38.54 billion dollars in one year the goal of doubling that to 77 billion dollars in economic impact by 2033 will make this one of the top two industries in the entire state. And treatments, the cures, the health innovations will make life better for people, not just in Arizona, but around the world. And so, you know, as we talk about doubling, it is our early stage companies that are going to grow and drive that growth. And our incubators, our accelerators, the virtual programs, the physical programs are all designed to help you do that. You need to reach out and ask for help because help is on the way. So thank you very much for everybody joining us today. Stay tuned for our next AZ Bio Peers in May. And don't forget, you need to be applying for the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference and if your company is starting to make great strides, you might be ready for an AZ Buy Award. You, those applications are open too. Thanks, everybody. See you next month on AZ Bio Peers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all.